This week on Arizona Illustrated, the effect of walls on wildlife. Glass gathered in the desert becomes a source of inspiration. And Arizona family's role in shaping the American civil rights story. And the 1989 Tucson Gem Show is in full swing from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Illegal immigration has been a contentious political topic for decades, with controversial ideas and policies on how to curb the flow of people entering the United States illegally. According to a recent NPR story, the federal government has spent $2.3 billion to build 649 miles of steel fencing in sections between the U.S. and Mexico. It's called tactical infrastructure, and supporters say it works. But those barriers can have unintended consequences. The San Pedro River is a verdant oasis in a sea of mostly desert brown. It's a resplendent ribbon of life that meanders through mountains and valleys, providing habitat and sustenance for hundreds of species that are dependent on life-giving water. Yeah, I can hear the yellow warblers right ahead of me here. Robert Weisler is with Friends of the San Pedro River, a nonprofit organization that works to protect the region. He says this environment is a place for reflection, exploration, and education. And the familiar sound of the Gila woodpecker. Omnipresent, really. Weiser says the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area also reminds him of another unique environment halfway around the world. He visited Egypt years ago. Of course, you see this broad, expansive desert, sandy desert. I mean, really, without any vegetation at all, not like here. So in the middle of that desert expanse was this green ribbon, and it was the Nile. It is the Nile. So. To me, this is kind of the miracle of southern Arizona. This is where you find migratory and breeding birds in high concentration because it has so much to offer. However, the future of this ecosystem is uncertain. Some researchers say pumping groundwater for growing human populations poses a threat to the river, while man-made projects to control illegal immigration and drug trafficking, they add, are damaging natural areas and disrupting animal populations. The San Pedro straddles two countries. It begins in Sonora, Mexico and travels north to Arizona. Formerly flowing freely, the rivershed is now obstructed by fences or other structures. The barriers are designed to keep people, drugs and vehicles from crossing into the United States from Mexico. It's blocking the animals, but it's not stopping people from crossing. Dan Millis works for the Sierra Club's Borderlands campaign, which opposes these barriers. We have seen ocelot, we've seen jaguar here. If a large mammal comes upon this wall, unless it's a monkey, there's no way it's getting over it. You can't get through this. There are smaller holes in the wall where there are low water crossings, small animals can get through. But uh, anything wider than four inches, out of luck. Aaron Flesch conducts studies on wildlife populations as a research scientist with the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Flesch says barriers, roads, and other man-made projects can have various detrimental impacts on nature, including these. Traditional migration patterns can be altered or stopped in some places. Habitats are divided and fragmented, separating historic environments and populations. And connectivity can be reduced or even halted. For example, Flesch says animals from one area may no longer be able to recolonize vacant habitats where the numbers of other members of their species have plunged or gone extinct locally due to random events such as disease. The inability to move or recolonize can lead to declines in populations, a reduction in their genetic diversity and health, and even possible extinctions over the long term. Metropolitan Tucson serves as an illustration of the challenges faced by animals. So behind me is Mount Lemmon in the Catalina Mountains, and to the south is the Santa Ritas, which is essentially the next closest available habitat patch to the south. And a black bear trying to move 
from Mount Lemmon down to the Santa Rita's is gonna have a pretty tough time getting through the city at the base of the Catalinas there. And a border wall can act very much in the same way by preventing movement between populations. John Ladd is a rancher next to the San Pedro River whose relatives have been working on this land since the late 1800s. Arizona was not a state back then and the family's cattle had a wider range where they could roam, stretching into what is now Sonora, Mexico. Great grandparents homesteaded in 1896. And back then, they went all the way to the mountain. That's the San Jose Mountain. That's, that's what the ranch is named after. In the past few decades, however, his daily ranch work has changed significantly. I spend about 50% of my time fixing fence or dealing with something that's broken, somebody tore it up. Um, before this immigration deal, we had fences that were 60 years old that were perfectly good. And, you know, this fence is eight years old and it's about shot. Ladd believes the walls are effective if they are patrolled by agents at the ready when breaches occur. Yet he also has personal knowledge of the barrier's failings with regards to wildlife. We had a really nice herd of mule deer that migrated in from Mexico every October, stay here till February. Probably have 200, 250 deer. And I probably got 40 deer left because they finished the wall in the October. They can't get across that. Nothing can get through that thing. Uh, birds can fly over it, but it, it's terrible. But people who are intent on entering illegally have their ways. They have a chop saw, a gas powered chop saw, a carbide blade, and they just cut everything. It takes 10, 15 minutes. And it, you know, it's a, a whole crew of people doing it, and it's staged and they're ready to go. State Representative Steve Smith says additional barriers and enforcement are needed to reduce unauthorized migration and the drug trade. Smith says there's already an example in Arizona where both approaches, walls and patrols, are working. Yuma, the Yuma sector, now what do we do there? Sent the National Guard out, built a double layer border fence, put proper law enforcement on the other side of the border to actually detain and arrest when illegal activity came over, had a swift judicial system in place to quickly expedite and either deport or imprison, whatever the case was. 95% of the illegal activity along that Yuma sector has stopped. And that's not Steve Smith saying it, that's, that's Yuma County saying it, that's Yuma law enforcement. Smith acknowledges these efforts could affect animals and plants along the border, but he says that should not stop the construction projects wherever feasible. Protecting our country and our citizens is the number one priority. But again, my oath of office is to the American people, not to, a, not to an animal species. And the U.S. Border Patrol says the jury is still out on the barrier's impact on wildlife. Here's part of a statement the agency is providing. Quote, the Tucson Sector Border Patrol uses two distinctive types of fencing, vehicle and pedestrian. Vehicle barrier fencing does not limit the movement of wildlife. Pedestrian fencing is used in urban areas where wildlife movement is not a significant consideration. Customs and Border Protection is not aware of any studies or data which support a conclusion that the border fence has resulted in any measurable impact on wildlife movement. Clearly, illegal immigration and the social and economic background and drivers behind it are much more complex than just the environmental effects of border infrastructure. But I think those problems are solvable, and I think if we put together multidisciplinary teams of folks and stakeholders together with the government, not just our government, but the Mexican government as well, that we can solve these problems. It's a question of what we value, and uh, nature is something fragile we shouldn't take for granted. And so these special resources have to have the ability to move in order to thrive. That's a values question. You know, I'm a scientist. I'm not really here to answer values questions necessarily. Um, I can tell you from my own personal viewpoint, and that is native animals have a right to persist for their own sake, especially because they were here before us. In the Tahona Autumn Nation, two men are turning recycling into an act of redemption. They found a way to build beautifully and sustainably with glass.
Sells, Arizona is only 60 miles from Tucson, but it's part of a different world. This is the desert where the Tohono O'odham have lived for generations. For Richard Pablo, it's a land of memories and glass. When I was growing up, a lot of people used to go out to the dances and they'd get beer, and it just seemed like fun. We'd jump on the road and hitchhike to those dances. It was something to do. It didn't seem really that bad. Richard thinks as he gathers glass. The desert holds thousands of bottles, left behind over decades as drinkers finished their alcohol and moved on. Some things we take in and we think that they're cool to do or all right or they give us a good feeling. And pretty soon before you know it, it's, it's ingrained in us. And the next thing you know, it takes over us. And a lot of people may have had dreams, hopes of doing things and maybe it really crushed them. When you have groups of people that have uh, ex experienced uh, cumulative trauma, that this trauma then is uh, transmitted from generation to generation if left unresolved. Edward Grijalva, a counselor and tribal liaison with Pascua Yaqui and Tohono O'odham roots, says that cumulative or historical trauma grew from the violence, displacement, and forced assimilation Native American communities endured. Now it lives on, he says, in cycles of abuse and addiction. It's a soothing mechanism where people are looking for some sort of relief, although people don't uh, necessarily go to the liquor store and say, I'm, I'm experiencing trauma, can you, so I'm buying a six pack. But if, if generations before them were doing the same thing, then they seem to think that it's okay. So I grew up with this alcoholism, some of the alcoholism at home. I didn't have a father. As I grew up, I didn't have really nobody. It turned really ugly after a while. After a while, it's almost dependent. You get dependent on it, and after a while, you're following for myself anyway, so I was lost in it. One day, we were going to Phoenix. I was working for the district, and we are going to Phoenix, and I all of a sudden, butterflies were flowing through my body, and I didn't know what it was, and I had a stroke. Soon after that, I, they released me. <clears throat> Some of my family members came up and picked me up, but not even probably on a Wednesday. And by that Friday, I was out drinking and doing coke again. Nobody could stop me. And I didn't want to die with everybody feeling that way. Richard found a way to start over and soon enrolled in Tohono O'odham Community College. That's where he met environmental scientist David Stone. I was making some adobe blocks and he came up and said, hey, I heard you were working on something interesting. Uh, I'd like to find out about this. And so we began to talk. David was working on this, cement that's made from glass. It's a discovery he made by accident. To keep iron from rusting in his lab, he had mixed it with water and silica, the main ingredient in glass. He got a reaction he didn't expect. It hissed. It steamed, it spat, it got hot, and I threw it away. I thought, well, that didn't work. The next day when I came in, the maintenance guys had not taken the garbage away, and I looked in and I found that the chunks of this stuff had gotten very hard. David received funding from the Environmental Protection Agency to bring his project to cells. We actually thought we were going to have to go to, to Tucson, or even the Phoenix, and bring in glass from these outside cities just to demonstrate the process. 
And when Richard heard about this, he said, wait a minute, I'll show you glass. Richard led him to all the drinking sites he knew, and the gathering began. The bottles are crushed into sand-sized and gravel-sized pieces, then combined with steel dust, water, and carbon dioxide. They react, and the iron rusts, creating a stone-like material. It's been used for several construction projects on the reservation, including a patio at the Tohono O'odham Nation Cultural Center and Museum. There used to be a big billboard, and it showed pictures of three autumn women. And the words on the billboard were, we have been in this desert for 500 years. Are we going to be here in another 500 years? I think so. The rest of the world might fall, but I think so. Four years after their friendship began, David and Richard are hoping their project has a future. The EPA funding is now gone, but they have proposed that the Tohono O'odham Nation continue making the cement as a commercial venture, a chance to create jobs and help the O'odham build better lives. I had never heard the terms intergenerational trauma or historical grief. And when I did come out, I not only heard those terms, but I saw what they meant. Richard, uh, very early on, told me as we were driving away from a bottle collection site. He kind of looked at me and laughed in the way he does and says, you know, David, you are interested in recycling broken glass. I'm interested in recycling broken dreams. That's what I'm doing here. In his gathering and thinking, Richard has found a flickering hope. We can get tied up in a lot of things if we if we let them. But if you untie those knots, there's more things to let in, and it becomes more beautiful, and somehow it unfolds itself, and it makes more room, and, there are, and it's, the fire gets bigger. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs, an easy way to submit your own story idea, an archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated, and you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. In the early 1960s, the American struggle for civil rights hit full stride in the Deep South. A thousand miles west in Phoenix, two enterprising black leaders, Lincoln and Eleanor Ragsdale, dedicated their lives to the struggle for desegregation of schools, neighborhoods, and areas of public accommodation in Arizona. Their efforts for racial equality in the Southwest played an integral and enduring role in the larger American civil rights story. Sometime in the fire. In the early 1960s, the American struggle for civil rights hit full stride in the Deep South a place and time familiar to almost every American. Over a thousand miles to the west, Phoenix, Arizona gave rise to an obscure but formative movement in the fight for African-American civil rights. Phoenix was considered the Mississippi of the West by many people who migrated here because once they, they migrated here, once they arrived, they found a very segregated city. The Ku Klux Klan was strong here, uh, many years, in the 20s and 30s. Two prominent figures led the civil rights struggle in the Southwest, Lincoln and Eleanor Ragsdale. Lincoln and Eleanor Ragsdale were certainly the most visible and perhaps the most prominent civil rights activists in the greater Southwest. They knew African dignitaries, they knew Martin Luther King, they knew Jesse Jackson, Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater. They knew just about everyone. Lincoln had tremendous guts. Lincoln would call me up from time to time and say, Herb, let's go have lunch. Oh my. Well, I know, was, I know from Lincoln, it'd be a restaurant that no black man had ever been to before. 
Eleanor Ragsdale, very erudite, very sophisticated, extremely cultured. But when the time came, she was right out on the streets, marching. She was the rose uh, of this whole movement. There's not enough things you can say about Eleanor Ragsdale. She was a marvelous woman. The Ragsdale kids in general were, were, were very active. Sometimes my parents would pull us out of class. So we would go on marches with them because they felt it was significant. It was a historical moment in time. During the Civil Rights Movement, the Ragsdales and other leaders in Phoenix focused on a number of key fronts. The first effort focused on the desegregation of hotels, restaurants, and other areas of public access. You were not able to go into restaurants and eat. You were not able to use the facilities. The places of public accommodation were segregated. The cemeteries were segregated. What people can't comprehend today, you see a black man in a restaurant or a hotel in any place in Phoenix, uh, yeah, what else is new? Nobody raises anything, and properly so. That was not the case. Uh, uh, years ago. In 1963, Herb Eli, the Ragsdales, and other leaders helped support a civil rights bill being considered by the Arizona State Senate. The debate in Arizona was this is an invasion of the sacredness of property rights. And to many of us, we said, the hell it is. There are certain property rights that have to be overridden by human rights. Sometime in the fire. And there were marches at the Capitol calling for a public accommodations bill. They were very intense. It was hot. This is Phoenix, Arizona. The temperatures went up into 100 degrees. You had them singing protest songs like, don't let nobody turn me around. Um, Lift every voice and sing, we shall overcome. You had folks on the west side and the south side of the Capitol actually involved in more tense conflicts with the police. This was a site of very intense protest. People began in the lower level of the rotunda area. They moved up the stairs to this particular level, standing, uh, sitting up against the wall, moving up to the higher levels of the rotunda area. I was about nine years old. I was on the second floor, and the police were coming in, removing everybody, and, and the police officer picked me up. He asked me, why was I marching? And I said, we were marching for our freedom. In 1964, the public accommodations bill was passed in Arizona in advance of the Civil Rights Act that was passed at the national level. Certainly in terms of public accommodation, Phoenix was ahead of the rest of the country. It was a major accomplishment. Another key accomplishment in the Southwestern Civil Rights Movement was the desegregation of schools. Carver High was a segregated school for African Americans until 1953, when the state of Arizona set precedent by passing the first school desegregation law in the country. The school is now a museum where former student Tommy Williams volunteers as a tour guide. How many of you know that this was formerly the Phoenix Union Colored High School? Phoenix was literally the first city in the United States to desegregate its schools in 1953, one year before the Brown decision. It brought a little attention and hopefully a little pride to our state. <laughs> so the Phoenix decision and those activists in Phoenix played a key role in the desegregation movement at the national level. Lincoln and Eleanor Ragsdale played a key role in raising necessary and vital funds to help support and bankroll this movement. So we're coming up here to the main part of Encano Park. In addition to school desegregation, the Ragsdales also worked tirelessly to initiate the desegregation of residential areas around Phoenix, starting with the Palmcroft and Canto district. The only people who had access to live here were white people, no blacks, no Hispanics. The Ragsdales really integrated, were the pioneers of integrating housing. Eleanor was so clever. You know, one of the first things that she did after she stopped teaching to help Lincoln in the businesses was get a real estate agent license. In 1953, Eleanor Ragsdale used her real estate license to purchase a house for the family in an all-white neighborhood and in doing so, initiated a residential desegregation movement which resonated throughout the state. This is where I grew up, 1606 West Thomas. There was no public accommodations in the neighborhood. You couldn't use the bathroom at the gas station down the street in the neighborhood. 
and they were to a certain degree terrorized when they moved into the home. They were then greeted with the N-word in big black letters on their white block wall on the side of their house. The purchase of that first house in a white neighborhood was a declaration of dignity and possibility. It was a statement, you know, we can do this too. And you're gonna have to deal with it. Lincoln and Eleanor Ragsdale spent their lives fighting for the dignity and possibility of civil rights. Their efforts in the Southwest played an integral and enduring role in the larger American civil rights story. I think the legacy of the Ragsdales is that they accomplished so much in the civil rights movement with dignity and a kindred spirit and not one full of animus and hate. And I think that's their biggest legacy. For about two weeks every year, tens of thousands of people from every continent in the world, rockhounds, gemologists, authors, artists, miners, as well as nearly 4,000 trade companies gather in Tucson for what most simply call the gem show. Here's what it looked like back in 1989 from the vault. They're back, the thousands of mineral collectors, rockhounds, and artisans who show up in Tucson every February for the Gem and Mineral Show. Is this Nat or Keystone? For the untrained eye, a lot of the goods displayed look, well, frankly, like rocks, albeit rocks with pretty colors. But it is not the untrained eye that sees the beauty, nor the bounty in these gems and minerals. For a lot of people, this show, which will attract literally hundreds of thousands of visitors, is a must. This is the only show I come to. I do, I make wholesale jewelry. I sell to retail shops. And I get a lot of my customers from here. I start planning at the end of this show for next year. Federico Baños brought his collection from Jalisco, Mexico, and found his fair to be among the more popular, particularly his pyramids and crystals. But one cannot simply forget the importance of this show, both to Tucson, which counts on millions being spent for the show's eight-day run, nor to the vendors who look at it as a means of making their expenses and more. To break even, I would probably want to make around $800 to $1,000 a day. I won't do it in this show, but I want to. For a collector, this show is nirvana. There is something here for almost everybody and every taste. For a lot of browsers, this show can be almost a religious experience, but for many others, it goes even beyond. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, the look of love, scientifically speaking. What do raptors, rattlesnakes, hummingbirds, and bats have in common this time of year? Fatherhood 101 and remembering Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.